Um, my mom played piano a bit, but okay. that was never in the house, and my dad was definitely tone deaf. But that's okay. He played violin when he was a kid. He's and a tone deaf violin player. Yes, yeah. without a doubt. He, uh, if a record skipped, he really wouldn't even know the difference. <laughs> but he loved music. He, he liked to listen to opera. He listened to any kind of music. He loved the show tunes. Didn't matter. Okay, so you did grow up around music. When did you when did you start playing an instrument, an actual instrument? An actual instrument? I don't know if this counts. It was fourth grade trumpet. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> so, uh, and it actually hurt when because when you blow a trumpet, you don't really blow into it. You kind of spit into the mouthpiece. Okay. Yeah. So, and it gets kind of funky. Yeah. So, so it really kind of hurt over here. So I left. I said I'm not doing this. And then, lo and behold, the Beatles came out. The Beatles. Oh, okay. you've heard of them? Yes. Okay, good. They, they were actually pretty popular. <laughs> but that's what really got me started. I wanted to be Ringo. I wanted to play the drums. I really wanted to play. That was it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started. Um, that was in junior high school. It was actually sixth grade. And I kept playing drums all along okay. uh, growing up. Um, I was in a band with kind of a famous guitar player who you guys may know. His name is Johnny Gale. Okay. Um, that was in junior high school, and we, we've kept up. He actually got to know me again through my son, because okay. my son plays guitar. What, uh, what made, how did you gravitate towards the bass? That's, it's, it's a twofold. I was in a band, we were playing in somebody's basement, I'm playing drums, who knows what kind of a, what song it was, but it was in the mid, early, earlier 60s, mm -hmm. 65 or so. And I'm playing, and there was me, two guitar players, a keyboard player, and a bass player, which was really rare. And he had a, Precision and a Fender Bassman, which was like unheard of at that point, because sure. everybody had a, an Ampeg B12 mm -hmm. and a Hackstrom. And we were playing, and everything's fine, and I'm playing the drums, and all of a sudden the bass player stops playing. And the room all of a sudden was like almost quiet, even though everybody else was playing. And I'm, whoa, that's great. He's got power. Mm. If the bass player stops playing, it sounds like crap. Half the music goes. It does. It was almost like somebody turned everything on half. And he finally um, plugged in again. He, I don't know what actually happened. Maybe he lost his cable or something mm. like that. And I was friends with him. And I'm like, I want to do that. that sound, I want to learn it. I don't want to give up drums, but I want to learn the bass. And eventually I, I, I learned all that. But I was playing drums and bass at the same time. Did you study formally? Who were your bass player role models? Uh, he was my role model. He actually gave me my, uh, my intro bass lessons. Mm -hmm. And he started to not like me because I was picking it up really, really quick. Okay. So I ended up getting my first bass ever was a Fender Mustang Ooh. in red. And it was cool. Um, and I was playing that. And then I went to a precision bass because I felt the Mustang was, you know, it was a beginner's bass. It was a beginner's bass, right. and everybody had better ones. Mm -hmm. And I got it, and I'm a small guy with small hands, mm -hmm. and it was probably like a 67-ish or so, mm -hmm. and the neck was like this wide to me. I felt like I was playing a, a Louisville Slugger baseball bat. <laughs> I hated it. So I still played it, but not that much. And now I'm playing bass, and I'm also playing drums. And then Cream comes out. Oh. So I'm listening and I can't keep up with the Ginger Baker stuff, but I'm doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. And then someone plays me Spoonful Live. Oh. Okay? Side three. There you go. <laughs> so I'm listening to it, and I'm hearing the drums, I'm hearing, and I'm like, what's that, what is that? And the guy says, that's the bass. I said, that's not a bass, it's this distorted. And he goes, that's the bass player. And he starts singing Spoonful. And I said, I want to so, all right, tell me, you're gravitating towards the bass, and you and you fall in love with Wheels of Fire, Side Three, yeah, Spoonful, uh, and Full. Spoonful, and everything else that came before it and after that, and the drums became less and less of something I wanted to do, and bass became more and more, and I wanted to sing as well. So that was part. It wasn't just the bass playing. Okay. I wanted to sing. So I started singing in my living room when no one was there, um, okay. and I would blast it because I knew I sounded lousy. Um, and eventually, uh, I worked at it. I worked at it really hard. Um, I would listen to Cream, and I would try to copy the notes, mm -hmm. and then I would try to put my own little twist on it and whatever. And eventually, probably 11th, 12th grade, I really got into a Cream kind of a thing, and it was great. And I, without saying, you know, I was really good. <laughs> <laughs> how, did you, how did you navigate singing and playing bass? That's the age-old 
dilemma, it's tough to say. It is language. tough, but because I wanted to do both, okay. I started at the same time. So it's not like okay. I started playing bass and then saying, oh, gee, I think I want to sing now. Okay. I did both at, it was a very big difference, mm -hmm. so I was really learning both at the same time, okay. and it really worked out well. Um, and I really try to train my voice to, to Jack's range. Um, I was copying him. What, what else can I say? That's right. what I wanted to do. Um, and that was really it for a really, really long time. You mentioned uh, Jack Bruce, your, your connection with Jack. You actually wrote liner notes? Yes, I did. Um, I'll try to compress this sure. as much as I can, but a friend of mine worked for a record company. Right. Um, and they used to come out and they would release concerts and they would you know, have these tape concerts and they put them on CDs. Mm -hmm. So he said to me, would you like to write, I know you're a big Jack Bruce fan, would you like to do the liner notes? I said, of course. He goes, I can't pay you. And I said, I don't care if you pay me. The only thing I want is my name that I wrote it. That's all I ask. And it was quite big, it was two sides and... Um, what record was it for? It was for Renaissance Records and it was called Jack Bruce Concert Classics, Volume 9. Okay. What happened to 1 through 8, I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was 9. Right. And um, I did it, and I loved it, and it came out, and I have like 50 copies. Um, <laughs> I love it. It's not in print anymore. So then what happened was he said, do you want to meet Jack Bruce? Mm. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm sweating. I said, what do you mean? He goes, he's coming to New York. He's going to be recording an original album for us. Okay. And if you want to meet him, and it was around Thanksgiving time, 1999. Okay. Um, and I said, yeah. And I walk into the studio. It was near Chinatown. It was a, it was, I don't think it was even digital. It was analog. Um, and I walk in and I hear him singing in the booth. Mm. And I'm, I'm dreaming. And I'm, I'm like peeking around the corner. And he comes walking out. And my friend says, Jack, this is uh, Alan. He's the guy that wrote your line of notes. And he looks at me, he goes, you're the guy who wrote that? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, you did a great job. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you can catch additional episodes and much more by visiting us on the web at knowyourbassplayer.com. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next time here on Know Your Bass Player.